and my my interest actually shifted almost entirely to uh, doing whatever I could do to to support that uh, that happy sangha. And then as I traveled around, I, I led just hundreds of retreats, and and every community that I'm that I was able to have the good fortune of being with, it became much more interested in it became much more about. And I became more interested in uh, just being able to support communities and to be with communities and nurture the community, the one that I was visiting. And, and it became less and less about, believe it or not, the teachings and the practice and more about the, the sustenance, the, the salve, the, just the beauty of people practicing together uh, and just I'm, I have such a sense of practice communities, examples of, of wisdom and loving kindness and compassion and harmlessness, at least to the extent that we can be aware of it, and at least as an intention, uh, it just has a fragrance in all the communities that I, I'm able to be with. And this one has been is my core community mission dharma and and it's still warm even online which is mind-blowing and it's also adopted many of the people from the communities that i've supported elsewhere and so it's it's really just one one big sangha and for me it's that is just as Thich Nhat Hanh said the next buddha is the sangha hmm. and it is so become so obvious to me that it is equal to the Dharma, to the teachings, equal to the Buddha, uh, both the Buddha within and the, and the immediate Dharma, uh, it's Sangha, equal. So I'm hoping that uh, some of that you feel, and, and if not here, find some um, family of yogis that you can hang out with, both support and be supported by. So I think I'll save the rest for later. I'm going to ring the gong. This is to honor one of our heart Sangha members, Madison, who has um, requested that we that she have a sense of when we're starting. And here we go. I'm hitting the gong. Maybe before you close your eyes, feel free to look around and at your fellow yogis. And maybe dedicate your practice to being a benefit to them as well as yourself. And just know that as you close your eyes and enter into the seclusion of practice, that uh, you are still being uh, bathed in their support, being bathed in a field of loving kindness and relative safety. And be aware that this safety and loving kindness and seclusion are actually a little bit rare in this world. It's where all the beings who don't have the privilege of this kind of safety. We also dedicate our practice to them with a wish that all beings can feel safe and protected. Safe with themselves and safe in this world. And that all beings can find that sacred happiness which is without sorrow here and now. 
See that all bring beings grow in serenity. One of the high benefits of this practice is finding that place of balance and ease and a lessening of our reactivity. Let your attention gather Mm. Appreciate that simple fact that you are aware here. What may be the ultimate fact? And let your sitting body fill your awareness. And let your awareness fill your sitting body. So you are so secluded in the body, so mingled with awareness that there's no dividing line. There's just bodyfulness. Notice how the attention and body come together and just feel so intimately, so closely, there's a stilling. And if you allow yourself to stay with that stillness without trying to hold it, Just be still. Just sense how effortlessly the sitting body is known. How effortless to be aware. It's it's intrinsic or natural. Just in support of remaining aware, maintaining some continuity of awareness, we support our attention with a connection that we can feel and receive of our body breathing. We feel very intimately and enjoy the body's experience of its own breath without making any attempt to alter that breath. Even appreciating the selflessness of this breathing body just does it by itself. Perhaps you are, I am, feeling the gratitude for this life breath. This wonderful anchor for attention. Wonderful giver of life. Spirit. Just this breath, just this moment. Even though our breath is our primary support, 
anchor. We welcome all other experiences, sensations, sounds, moods, thoughts, and we let each expression of awareness be a support. Everything calling us here. Everything reminding us that we are aware. So each experience is equal in the light of awareness. No need to look for other experiences, just settle back into the moment, feel the support of the breath, and then see what else pops. Or if you're feeling quite steady and continuous in awareness, just let go of the primary anchor and just be aware. Just let awareness itself be your anchor and see what pops up on its own. Just this moment, just this breath, just being aware, or just this body.
When you realize you've been lost in thought, daydreaming, fantasizing, remembering, worrying, whatever it might be, it's a sign that mindfulness has re-arisen. An opportunity to really sense that light coming back online, sense of presence, in support of remaining anchored to this living experience, we gently feel our body and breath. Returning to being, returning to being aware, embodied. Home, just this moment.
Quite remarkable how a few minutes of putting aside our usual to-do list, preoccupations, plans, memories. Uh, there's so much silence waiting and, and uh, just a kind of natural plumbing of the, of the consciousness. And I'm just really appreciating and very grateful for the meditative process and tonight, you know, before we started, I was, I was waxing about sangha and community and the beauty of sitting together and how community has become over the years uh, really the highlight for me and the Dharma. But then as I sat tonight and as the consciousness opened, I, I just started, not started, but I connected with that feeling, that deep feeling of love that I have for each person, the opportunity to love. I mean, it's so, it's so, such a privilege. And it's given me so much confidence that the closer uh, we are with objects of attention, but the closer we are with people, uh, the more it naturally breeds affection. And that's such a privilege to be able to feel that and to feel that exchange of goodwill and good intentions. And um, so just unbelievably grateful for that, uh, the opportunity in this life to, uh, to get to know and love so many people. Uh, so that's what bubbled up during the sitting. Curious if anything bubbled up for you just in general and uh, on this week and in this time. Uh, thought I would just open it up a little bit and then I have some stray thoughts. It just seemed a little odd during the sitting to, to just name all the things I'm grateful for. <laughs> you may not want to hear what I'm grateful for. Uh, I am curious about what you're what's on your mind for thanksgiving or of course any meditative questions uh, comments descriptions and know that your comment or question about the dharma mostly um, non-theoretical will likely be of some support to someone else so howie howie g feel free thanks for breaking the ice um this is uh, something that occurred to me while i was sitting but it's not really about the sitting um, I was reading this week about fig trees for some reason, um, about, about the fig, and um, it seems that the um, Bodhi tree, or oh, is that how you pronounce it, the Bodhi tree? Bodhi tree, that's great. Is, is a fig tree, and there's like hundreds of kinds of fig trees, it seems, and the thing that they said is that the fig is either the only or one of the few fruits that actually kind of flower inside of itself you know i mean it's the petals are inside of the fruit somehow or i didn't really concentrate on the specifics but i thought the significance or at least the the metaphor of that was just so lovely you know that um the idea of uh this kind of internal flowering Yes. Uh, and and how appropriate uh, that would be for somebody like the Buddha or anybody. Gorgeous. To, uh, Thank, to latch you. Onto. Thank you. That's all. all right. Beautiful. Have you read the poem from Gal? I think it's Galway Canal. The one, the one where he says, it's, "Sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness," and and it talks about how it awakens through self-blessing and something that's very similar to what you just said so if you ever get a hold of that poem it's called uh, something in the sow anyway look it up thank you anybody else Let's see Hang on, I have to do it. 
do full screen. There we go. Comments, questions, anything. Was that Jerry? Did he, you raise your hand? I see David, David, but then I saw Sabina's hand, but we'll go with David since your hand is up first and then I'll. Okay. Um, this is really just an observation, but, um, you know, maybe a month ago, I sort of had, it was something that you said, Howie, and I can't remember what it was, but it was just like this catalyst, which was, you know, something we've all heard over and over, just come back to the present. But it was like, I heard it in a way I'd never heard it before. And it's just really interesting that, you know, I've been sitting, as you mentioned, for many years, but it was like this breakthrough. And and whenever I'm getting either distracted or I'm just going for a walk or washing the dishes, it just, it's like a thought that comes to me much more often than it ever did before. And it was something you said, I, I don't even remember what it was, but it happened during a sitting. And um, I don't know, it's, I guess the point is you just never know when your practice is going to shift, you know, when you're gonna, something's going to break through. Well said, thrilled for you. Just keep remembering. <laughs> Isn't it amazing, though, the moment we do reorient ourselves to real time, something in us relaxes and real time becomes, the way I like to say it, it becomes so much more compelling than my desire to be somewhere else just yeah. gets a little bit less and I feel more at home. So, beautiful. Thank it, you. David. It just makes you wonder how many other in all of our practices, how many other examples or instances on, you know, some other realm, some other plane, you know, can happen at any time. It's on on the way to enlightenment, as it were, <laughs> on the road. Well, as, as uh, Zen Master Dogen would say, uh, meditative awareness is not a means of enlightenment, it's enlightenment itself, mm -hmm. that moment of being aware. So, and or it's enlightened activity. So don't, not, don't, uh, don't uh, underestimate the power of that simple moment that you just described. Thank you. Sabina, do you, was that your hand before? It was it I didn't use the digital hand I, I no problem hand. um no I was just going to say I'm feeling really grateful for this weekly meeting just as a place of refuge um that word and that concept has been really present for me lately I'm sure for a lot of people um and I'm grateful because I'm feeling less afraid of just being with what's happening and like slowing down and finding joy in the midst of things that are really hard. So I really yes. am so glad I have been coming back and I'm knowing that this group exists and like seeing all the faces and feeling the support, like you said at the beginning is, is profound for me right now. So I want to thank everyone who's here. Thank you. A lot. <laughs> nice to have you with us. Thank you. Mary, please. Sorry, I was mute. I just wanted to say to that lovely lady that just spoke, I felt feel exactly the same way. So I want to thank her and everyone, and especially you, Howie. You know, it's it's a a very challenging time, and sometimes a very sad time. You know, there's a lot of pain in the world, and at the same time, I think we try to meditate and be in the moment and be in nature. And, and then there's that peace and that joy, but it kind of, you know, goes back and forth and it's kind of, you know, uh, up and down sort of thing. So I, th I think we're all, or I can speak for myself, very grateful to have this. I was really grateful to be here tonight. Thank grateful you. grateful to have you here tonight too 
Thanks to everybody. Your practice and your years of practice, it rubs off on everybody here. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. It seems like a little small space for to be to call it public speaking, but I still think it brings up some of the same issues uh, of speaking in public. But I uh, hopefully you treat it a little bit like your living room and it's part of the friendship of Sangha. It's where our words are a little more safe and um, so feel free. And I understand if it feels like a big room full of bunch of people. Okay. Thankful for the silences. And personally, tonight, I, I found the silence really engulfing, just, uh, just very absorbing in a way. And, and I know that, um, that it was the fruit of having just led a retreat you know i'm also very grateful for the for the community that i was with in in the houston area and then victoria the week before and here every tuesday uh, part of what i was grateful for was so many opportunities to sit and to remind myself and others of the of the living dharma which is just so different than uh, our imaginings of past and future uh, that tend to when we dwell in in our imagination we tend to miss and uh, lose lose contact with it, this living present that is so um, engulfing in a way and so satisfying and you know as david was talking about just coming back to present time it's um it's just so uh, so alive oops excuse me eve don't want to miss this opportunity please feel yeah. free thank you yeah really wonderful to be with everyone this evening um and to have a little space i have a little more space this week just to kind of be in the flow of the world um and I'm finding, um, you know, as other folks have mentioned, you know, obviously it's such a hard time in our world. And in in practice, there's this interesting moment of a very personal feeling of grief. And then it coming to this more kind of universal feeling of grief. And my resistance to wanting to go there just melts. Um, and it just feels like really such a full, complete, and beautiful shared experience. So mm. just wanted to share that. And Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thank and so you. you were saying that your resistance when you're alone and you feel more more free or safe to do that. Yeah. 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 Like feel... in the day to day, it's like, oh, I don't want to listen to this or think about that or, you know, get engaged mm. in some of the difficulties in our world and but then just sitting and it just naturally will arise because thoughts yes, arise and yes 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 well and, said yeah so just really beautiful to be in community with you all thank you good to have you here too and when i just for the rest of you when i think of eve i also think of a long term yogi and she's also supported our community She's led the Tuesday night group and teaches on her own, and but she's really long support for Mission Dharma for those who maybe haven't been around. So please, Aoife.
I don't have, I'm not hearing anything. Maybe you're, you're muted. <laughs> I am muted. There you are. <laughs> Probably uh, said. <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, things are very uh, tumbled up in the world and also tumbled up where I live this past week. So uh, a lot of clinging has been going on. Mm. And I had this beautiful moment today where that was going on and I was escaping into thought and I came into the present moment and I go, oh, being in the present moment is incredibly sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, oh, this is very sweet. And it really helped. I mean, I don't know if I'm clinging to being in the present moment or not, but <laughs> but that really helped to realize the beauty of the present moment and how sweet it can be. It was very mm -hmm. encouraging um, to want to stay here. <laughs> and I don't know if I, I'm not sure I've ever quite had that kind of experience I, it just was quite lovely so i great. just i'm thrilled that. great you and david are on the same wavelength <laughs> that's gorgeous <laughs> and i don't know if i have it with me tonight but there's a wonderful passage from the buddha called one fortunate attachment and that's the present moment <laughs> as to to just notice each presently arising experience that's one fortunate attachment and to do it with a certain urgency because uh, you never know when when um, you won't be able to so so thank you for bringing that into the room ruth please feel free there you go um, I was with my mother in the emergency room for about four hours uh, last Friday, and she's a fine. I mean, she's okay. But she's she's ninety five and she's having a lot of problems. But mm. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't terrible. Terrible. It was just things that needed to be dealt with. Um, and it was very hard. Uh, you know, I just was, you know. It was hard and and then at a certain moment after about three and a half hours of this being there and going through all the various tests and people in the emergency room kind of moaning and crying and uh, you know how do you exist with other people's pain being so close you know it was very that that felt i didn't know it had a hard time with that but um so but then when she was in this other place um where they were kind of waiting for the doctor to come i just sort of remembered a kind of um meditation idea that i listened to from someone where you just kind of you know surround yourself with space and are present sort of embodied awareness right and i was just like oh there's my mother lying in a bed we're in a hospital oh just oh it was a relief <laughs> so for a couple minutes you know <laughs> marvelous let's let's all give thanks to that capacity to just be aware We're often looking for something much more exotic but that the ordinariness is is really the extraordinariness of it so i'm glad you're naming it and david and others so thank you and good luck with your mom. My mom's 97, so I can, I really resonate when fine and dealing with stuff all the time. We're lucky we have our moms at this age. 
anyone else it, what i'm the what i'm sensing tonight is the a lot of uh, gratitude for just the capacity to be aware and that was it's interesting i had a little list of nine different things that i was grateful for and number one was awareness <laughs> so i don't need to tell you about that although speaking of the world etc i stumbled on something that i had received from my colleague and friend anna douglas who lives down here in arizona where i'm visiting right now where my daughter lives and and she had she was dealing with some medical things and she had heard about this concept that the military uses the u.s military it's called vuca i know i talked about it one tuesday night sometime a while back and it's it's especially for it's for particular tough situations in battle it's called vuca and it stands for volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous and i think that that would describe our lives and and the times volatile uncertain complex and ambiguous and it seems what is what is really um, what is really a a um, in some ways a secret teaching is that the capacity to accommodate that to work with it is made um, it's made easier with the benefit of being aware. Awareness makes everything more workable. Once you are aware of something, so there's being with your mother, being with my mother, and then there's, and which is, I can easily become very absorbed in the identities and the roles and the, but then when there's that moment that Ruth spoke about, oh, here we are, being aware with my mother. There is a perspective. There's a there is a moment of non-reactivity. There's a moment of what are the antidotes for all the forces that cause war in the world? There's just greed, hatred, delusion. There's the absence of that in that moment of awareness. There's non-greed, non-hatred, non-ignorance in any moment of being aware. So that's why I think that's one of the reasons we feel such a, a relief such a beautiful fragrance because there is a it within that is a cessation it's a falling away of those defilements in that moment the forces of greed hatred and delusion because they can't coexist with that moment of noticing of really being present and then even if as Eva was saying even if you notice clinging to a pleasant that moment that's just another thing to notice when you're caught up in it it will cause you stress when you notice oh this is clinging this is trying to hold on it's trying to replicate that's just another mindful moment and then when we relate to it with mindfulness with awareness then it seems funny it's, it's we can work with it it's like oh it's kind of a joke really clinging today but being able to relate to everything make that shift from being caught up in whatever it is that is happening in our life to noticing it even our biggest hindrance our biggest impediments our biggest delusion is no longer delusion when it is brought under that light of attention when we can see pride, inflation, deflation, self-view, uh, 
our opinions and our views and our passions, things that 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 we're so we care so much about and become so bound up in when we see ourselves doing it, something in us relaxes, loosens up a little bit. So I, 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 even though I, even though the, the next Buddha is, is the Sangha, the Buddha in us, that which is awake and aware, it's a source of incredible gratitude um, and thanks. Hmm. And when there is the mixture of, you know, we are together, but then when there's the mixture of being, of knowing that we are together, knowing that we are, we don't really exist completely independently from each other, the knowing of that, it brings us, it just enhances that experience, makes it, it all even more meaningful and, and connectable so awareness yeah happy to be aware are you open to what's number two on the list hmm. <laughs> ah, it's really the same it's the, it's more the, what feels like, whether it is or not is another story, but what feels like the, the primordial awareness, the, the unshakable quality. You know, that moment you wake up to where you are, you return to, to that which is always here, but gets lost in the busyness of our minds and the uh, absorption of our activity, but what we return to is this ever-present wakefulness and clarity. We call it the Buddha awake, and it is, uh, and it is um, entirely not just the fact that it has the the fragrance of of a little more freedom, the lessening of greed and hatred and ignorance, but it is. Um, it is without any boundary, but without any bondage. It's without. It's free. It's it's boundless. It's unconditioned. It's unborn. It's it's um, it's not an it, but yet everything is known. Uh, and it's. It's self-knowing. It knows itself as as freedom, and yet it's clear from the direct experience of our of that unconditional nature that which the Buddha recommended that you aim for. This this is the well-being. This is the happiness of peace. This is the well-being that doesn't that doesn't. Uh, depend on conditions. This is a, this is a mind that's free of hunger, free of thirst. It's not uh, misplaced faith that we usually put in in uh, ever changing pleasures of our senses. This is the this is the bedrock of well being and happiness, and it's your own mind. So I'm incredibly grateful for a, a little glimpse of of that and, and I actually brought along a few of my favorite reminders of that ever present wakefulness and clarity. In some ways it is an experience of existence. It's an experience of um, of just being 
alive. So it's very accessible in a way. But being conscious. So it, I'm reminded of the unconditioned when I hear the words of Henry David Thoreau. He wrote these words in a letter to to Walt Whitman, and he said, I am grateful for what I am and what I have. My thanksgiving is perpetual. It's surprising how contented one can be with nothing definite, just a sense of existence. Oh, how I laugh at my vague, indefinite riches, for no run on my bank can drain it. For my wealth is not possession, but enjoyment of being. And then an old standard from, I, maybe some of you had the benefit of being with him, but I, I went to his lecture in San Francisco, I think it was in the mid-1980s with Kalu Rinpoche, Tibetan master who, who was just completely luminous. It was that sense of the lights on, but nobody home, just, just a field of light, just gorgeous, uh, transparent being. He said, there's nothing to be gained, nothing to be found that is not there already. Truth is so simple. Buddhahood is so simple, so self-evident. Truth is here, even in on this Zoom call. He didn't say that. Truth is you, the supreme silence, shunyata, infinity is in you. You are the silence. You are the truth. You are Buddha. It is here in this very moment, so simple and unaffected, so near, yet we make it so distant when it is so near, so remote when it is so immediate, so complicated when it's so simple. You are the Buddha. But why don't you feel it? Why don't you know it utterly through and through? Because there's a veil in the way, which is attached to appearances such as the belief that you are not the Buddha, that you are a separate individual, and anatma. If you cannot lift this veil at once, then it must be dissolved gradually. If you've seen through it totally just once, even one glimpse, then you can see through it all the time. Wherever you are, whatever presents itself, however things seem to be, simply refer to that ever-present, inherent wakefulness and clarity. Or just the reminder of the the closeness of of the the deepest source of peace that it's the it's the end of the rainbow for all of us that which we long for most is none other than our our near the near nature <clears throat> from from the Advaita Vedanta tradition from Ramana Maharshi. No special effort is necessary to realize this freedom. All efforts are for eliminating the present obscuration to this truth. A woman is wearing a necklace around her neck. She forgets it, imagines it to be lost, and impulsively looks for it here, there, and everywhere. Not finding it, she asks her friends if they found it anywhere until one kind friend points to her neck and tells her to feel the necklace around her neck. The seeker does so and feels happy that the necklace is found. Again, when she meets other friends, they ask her if her lost necklace was found. She says yes to them, as if it were lost and later recovered. Her happiness at rediscovering it around her neck is the same as if some lost property was recovered. In fact, she never lost it, nor recovered it. 
And yet at once she was miserable and now she's happy. So also with the realization of freedom from Ramana. I sometimes think of myself as a one note Johnny, you know, I talk about one thing and, and the intention is to point to that ever present freedom that we are. And just so grateful for how accessible if you just tune in after the last thought has ceased and before the next one comes. What What's here when we're free of our usual absorptions for a moment? Peace, space, open, welcoming, inviting, comfortable. That's why Gandan Rinpoche ends his fav famous poem about simple and easy. He says, don't go into the tangled jungle looking for the great awakened elephant who's already resting quietly at home in front of your own fireplace. I'm very grateful for the, to have that sense. And having, and any of you who've practiced long enough and have experienced your yourself, not the idea of yourself, but that direct experience of, that has a certain, uh, you know, the individuality has a certain particularity but the knowing in you is, 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 you can't even put it into words, like consciousness. It's, it's beyond any small, it's beyond any grandiose description of yourself. In fact, the most descriptions of ourself are, are insulting and usually some version of, of not enough the way we think about ourselves, but our direct experience, not historically, but right now, is boundless and free. And so we begin to, yogis, and this is I'm also grateful for, we just know the difference between that version of ourselves that plays in our mind and the, and the natural happiness of being conscious. And obviously, I'm grateful for all the resources that have crossed my path. And one of them being from James J. Audubon, who said, if, if there's a difference between the bird and what the field guide book says, believe the bird. Believe what you experience directly. And then enjoy the story of yourself. Enjoy your history. But don't let yourself be defined by it. You've, you're much greater. Because the story of your life is all about going. It's all about becoming. It's all about having come from the past, passing through here on our way to somewhere else. But, this, but stepping out of that story, your nature is freedom. Is the heart. It's love. So super grateful for that. And I think I'll, we'll just do a grateful month or something. So as I have, I'll give you a little sneak preview without going into it, if you're open to it. Number three was really connected to what I just said, that I'm very grateful not to believe my thoughts to the same extent that I used to. The thought of myself is not myself. It's just a thought. Uh, obviously, I'm incredibly thankful for the teachings that uh, at least help me see where to look to study life so that I, it, would, it would have the effect of helping me to let go. So looking at the fact of change um, and looking at the power of, of um, our actions to either create, as Hafez says, you carry all the ingredients to turn your life into a, into a nightmare. Don't mix them. You carry all the ingredients to turn your existence into joy. Mix them. That, that possibility of being, of 
training our lives to have more happiness and well-being. I'm very grateful for that. And all, all the teachings. And then obviously the uh, my parents who, you know, their their open their adventuresomeness, their open mindedness. That it, I think it really helped me turn into a Dharma adventurer and to spend years in silence, you know, things like that. So super grateful for my parents, my family, my wife, who's my number one guru, humor and wisdom and grace and kindness. And my daughter, Molly, who I know I've shared a lot over the past, uh, who was, I, when she was three, she was my, she became my main guru because I saw, she helped me to see the process of how one goes from a perfect expression of life to developing a view of herself the one that plays in her mind where she was not quite right and compared and tried to make her hair look like other people's and her being like other and to be able to see her navigate to the, the, maintain her sense of molliness at the same time have this view of herself as uh, as needing somehow to be different than the way she is what a great teaching and but she's also a love that she's really happy to and then uh, number seven, uh, be, just being able to see the difference between concepts and reality. And in that, I'm also grateful to Joseph Goldstein. If you ever want to listen to the preeminent Western Dharma teacher and an incredible Dharma talk, one entitled Concepts and Reality by Joseph Goldstein, it'll, it, will, it turned on a whole generation of yogis. And then my other teachers, which I'll do another night. Um, I think that's enough for tonight, but I am so grateful for, for ha you having supported me to keep my practice alive, both the, my practice of sharing, my practice of continuing to learn the Dharma, incredibly grateful. And um, I'm giving thanks a lot this Thanksgiving and um, never having too far from my mind that though all those beings who are who don't exist apart from me who are suffering and who we have to widen our view to have the whole the joys and the sorrows and I'm grateful for the Dharma for at least helping me begin to um, just as Eve was talking about kind of let it in and uh, be able to have both joys and sorrows and re and maintain some balance. So that's all I have tonight. I have one a last prayer for, and then I'd love to hear a good night. You know, feel free to say good night to each other, but I'll leave us with John O'Donohue, his beautiful uh, poem for peace. As the fever of day calms toward twilight, may all that is strained in us come to ease. We pray for all who suffered violence today. May an unexpected serenity surprise them. For those who risk their lives each day for peace, may their hearts glimpse providence at the heart of history that those who make riches from violence and war might hear in their dreams the cries of the lost, that we might see through our fear of each other a new vision to heal our fatal attraction to aggression, that those who enjoy the privilege of peace might not forget their tormented brothers and sisters, that the wolf might lie down with the lamb that our swords be beaten into plowshares and no hurt or harm be done anywhere along this holy mountain. May it be so.